grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, gathered to bask in the glory of God, which is His Word. This season of Epiphany, at least for a few weeks, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are focused on this theme of Jesus revealing Himself. Jesus, last week we learned, had revealed Himself, His glory, in the, in the miracle at the wedding of Cana, thus proving that He was who He claimed to be. In other words, the Son of God, the Messiah, our Savior. And His disciples put their faith in Him and in His claim. This week, we, we travel with Jesus to the town of Nazareth, his hometown, to where Jesus enters the synagogue on the Sabbath, and after reading the scripture from Isaiah, announces to everyone that that scripture is fulfilled in their ears, that, that he himself is the fulfillment of those scriptures. And the reaction of those hometown family, friends, acquaintances, might call to mind uh, the stanza four of Martin Luther's favorite or famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The fourth line or stanza of that hymn begins this way. The word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. What was Luther saying by that? He, was, he meant this, that, that there will always be people in the word who don't believe God's word. They, they, will, they will hear it, maybe they don't want to hear it, but they, they leave it, they let it remain. That is, they reject it. And as a result, they never have any kind of gratitude in their hearts for what God has accomplished and what He still accomplishes through that powerful Word. Now, if it were up to them, most likely, they would do everything in their power to eliminate the, the Word from the world. If they could, they would find every last copy of God's Word, even every fragment of God's Word, and destroy it to rid the world of it forever. However, the mighty God stands in their way, and He will not let that happen. According to His promise, heaven and earth will pass away, His Word will never pass away. It will never falter, fail, or fall. So we read in our gospel lesson that Jesus had now traveled to Nazareth. Uh, it, it took place early in his ministry. We, we know from the context of scripture that he's been in, in the Galilee region, in the northwest part of the region of the Sea of Galilee. This town of Capernaum mostly. Uh, he, we know he did a miracle at Cana, the first one in Cana, which is in that same region. And now we're told that Jesus was headed home. He was going back to Nazareth. We, we know that he was going back to a lot of fanfare and a lot of buzz because he had raised a girl from the dead. He had cleansed a leper. He had cast out a demon. And, and the writers tell us that he had done many other miracles that they don't specify. So he'd done a lot of things that created a lot of buzz. And now he was headed back to the hometown of Nazareth. And you can imagine the reaction of the people. They were excited. Their hometown boy had made good. And now they had the privilege of, of welcoming him to, the, to their synagogue on the Sabbath. Because that's what Jesus would do. You could expect that, that the, that the Son of God who came to be righteousness for us would be in the synagogue listening to God's word on the Sabbath. But there was a custom, and that was when, a, when a, a rabbi would come to, a visiting rabbi would come to the synagogue, they would typically give him the, the honor to read from Scripture and then expound on it, to expound or, or to offer commentary on that Scripture. And so the hometown people were just so thrilled to give Jesus that opportunity. So the attendant picks up the, one of the scrolls of the, of the Old Testament and hands it to Jesus. Now, I, I suppose it would not have, mat, have mattered what scroll from what Old Testament book they had handed to Jesus because 
you and I are well aware that all Scripture gives witness or testimony about Jesus. He would have found a passage in any one of those books that would have spoken about him. But as he would have it, they handed him the scroll of the book of Isaiah. I don't know where your knowledge of Isaiah is at this moment, but I can tell you that having read it a few times and memorized several sections of Isaiah, there are lots of places you could have turned to in the scroll of Isaiah that would clearly have portrayed Jesus and his work. Jesus, in his divine wisdom, however, turns to Isaiah chapter 65, and he reads the words that we had read earlier. And then he makes... He, he uh, rolls, finished reading, he rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant, and he sits down, because that was customary. You stood to read scripture, you sat to teach scripture, or to offer explanation and commentary. So he sat down, and you can imagine what Luke describes here. Everybody's eyes in that synagogue, and you have to imagine on this particular Sabbath, they, they came out of the woodwork, right, to, to see the hometown boy, huh? And uh, they, the eye just glued to Jesus. What is he going to say now? Right? What's he going to do now? And Jesus begins his sermon. Now it's a short sermon. There's a few more sentences after this. But essentially the main point of the sermon is the first line of his sermon. Today, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. We might say, today these words are fulfilled in your ears or before your very eyes. You see what Jesus had done. He had directed their attention, first of all, to God's Word, and then he directed their attention to him as the Word made flesh. He was telling them, these words are talking about me. Now, you and I might well imagine if Jesus showed up this morning and he read Scripture and talked about himself, we would just be filled with joy that Jesus would do that. It might be hard to sit in our seats. That wasn't quite the reaction of the people in, in Nazareth, however. We, we read that they were amazed. They, they were full of wonder, but, but listen to what they said. Oh, he speaks so well. His words are such full of grace. Oh, isn't this Joseph's boy? They had missed the point of the sermon entirely. They, it wasn't even in the wheelhouse. They were concerned with how well he had read the Hebrew. What a nice voice he has. Oh, this is our boy. This is the one we know. We know him because we saw him grow up. We know his dad and his mom. That's what's going on in their hearts and minds. Of course, and they're anticipating more. Now what's he going to say? Now what's he going to do? Like I said, they had totally missed the point of his sermon. So Jesus continues his message. And he says, well, surely you would quote this proverb to me. Physician, Heal yourself. Now, that was a common proverb, but what did it mean? Physician, heal yourself. Well, Jesus kind of explains for us what that means. That do for yourself what you do for others. In other words, do here in your hometown for your hometown people, right? For your, for your family, your friends. What we've heard you're doing all over the other the region, like in Capernaum and Cana, right? We want to see some, some miracles. Why would they want that? Well, I think there, at first there's just a natural curiosity. Have you ever heard of somebody who can do a miracle? You'd like to see that too, wouldn't you? But I think there's something more behind it that Jesus gets to in the, the rest of his sermon, and that is they wanted to be legitimized. They wanted to be considered by this rabbi to be at least as great, if not better, than those crazy people over there in Capernaum. And after all, why not? I mean, they were the hometown people. That's not, I, I think if, uh, if you and I had been there as counselors to the Lord Jesus, we might have said, Lord, you might as well give them what they're asking for, do a few miracles, whatever, and we can move on. Right? I mean, why not? Why not, why not keep riding the tide of popularity, that rising tide? Don't do anything to jeopardize your popularity with the people. I and mean, if you want an audience for, for God's word and for your preaching, my goodness, just do some miracles and they'll be happy with you. But again, Jesus demonstrates that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Jesus instead does nearly the opposite. He, he said something that was sure to raise their dander. He calls them on their unbelief, and he calls them to repentance. 
And he does that in a very wise and witty way. He, he continues by saying, well, you know, back in the Old Testament, out of the time of Elijah, the great prophet, there were a lot of widows in Israel. And, and that was during the three and a half years of famine. I mean, we think we got supply chain problems now, but three and a half years of famine will make anyone desperate. But Elijah the prophet was not sent to any of those ladies in Israel. Why not, you have to ask yourself? Because they didn't go to the prophet and ask him for help. They wouldn't open their homes to the prophet. And why not? Because they didn't believe in God. They didn't want to hear the word of God through, through this prophet. And so God has no choice but to send him to where? To, to Zarephath, the region of Sidon. That's on the northwest coast of the Mediterranean from the, where the Holy Land is located. This is a Gentile woman. And she believes the word of the Lord spoken through the prophet. And God provides miraculously for her and her family and for Elijah for those three and a half years. Oh, and Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I, there were lots of lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha. He's the successor to Elijah. To Elisha the prophet. And none of those leopards were cleansed by God. Why not? They never came to the prophet looking for help to be cleansed. They didn't care. They, they had rejected the, God's word and the prophet. They were still crying out to their false gods. God's not going to reward their unbelief. So where does, who, who does get cleansed in that time period of Elisha the prophet? Oh, that's right. One man was cleansed. He was the captain of the guard, the general of the king of Syria. Again, a Gentile, a foreigner. An enemy came and had enough respect for the prophet to listen to him and then put his faith in God's promise and in his word. And he, dipping three, four, seven, excuse me, seven times in the Jordan River, was healed from leprosy. Do you get what Jesus is telling the people? They got it. He said, the reason I'm not going to do any miracles here is because you've missed the whole point of my sermon. You don't believe who I say that I am. In fact, you didn't hear it. You refuse to listen. You're unbelievers. And God's not going to reward your unbelief with miracle, miracles. Well, Jesus received the reaction that we could have predicted for him when he failed to do miracles for the people and keep them appeased. They, they were very angry. Frustrated, probably no less, but really angry. So angry that they were whipped up into this mob-like frenzy. And with mob-like mentality, they figured now was the time to just get rid of this guy. How dare he come to his hometown and talk to them like that? So push him out of town and off the cliff. All the way off the cliff on which the town was built. And that's when Jesus performed the only miracle he performed in Nazareth, he escaped. How disappointing for these people who thought they had known Jesus. Who thought they knew who Jesus was because they knew the family in which he had grown up. Huh? See, they, they wanted this, this hometown boy and come back to, to tell them how much he loved them. They wanted someone to tell them how much God loved them in spite of all their problems, that God would overlook that in love. They wanted someone who would, you know, put on a show, do some miracles for them and validate them. They, they wanted someone who would do for them what they wanted when they wanted it done. What they received was the genuine Jesus. And the genuine Jesus wasn't the Jesus they thought they, they knew. The genuine Jesus pointed out their unbelief and their sin and had called them to repentance. He had called them in that first line of, the, of his sermon to put their faith in him, the only one who could save them. And that is what infuriated them. How dare he? How dare this young hometown boy that we've all seen grow up, we saw his dad bring him to the synagogue every Sabbath, how dare he come in here and call us out for our unbelief? 
the world is filled with people still like this today. Oh, they know so much about Jesus. They know him because why? Because, quote unquote, they've read the Bible. And yet, they all thought they knew him so well and found themselves disappointed and angry with him. This Jesus didn't tell them that it was okay for them to live any way they wanted to live, that God would love them anyway. This, this genuine Jesus doesn't give them what, what they want whenever they want it. <clears throat> he doesn't tell them what they want to hear. This Jesus tells the truth. So, a question for us to answer is, <clears throat> can we, we be counted among them? Are there times when you ask this question? Lord, why, why do you always have to be calling me to repentance? Why do you always have to be reminding me of my sin and my shortcomings? There's always this constant call to repent, to repent. And then we got this, it's so frustrating to come to worship every week and yet we go through this stodgy old liturgy and what do we have to say every week? Thank you. I confess that I am a sinner. I am by nature sinful and unclean. Why, like, I'm pretty good. I mean, I try really hard. I, I don't know that I can do any better than I'm trying, and you should accept that. And why won't you do for me the miracles I've seen work in the lives of others? Why, why won't you give me the things for which I, I wish and want, the things for which I pray, the way I pray it. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't work that way with Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the servant of God, as Isaiah revealed him. And for his sake, he is a servant to us. But we are not the masters. Our God remains the master. And so the, the children don't dictate to the Lord what he should do, when he should do it, or what he should say and how he should say it. No, rather, in our relationship with Jesus, it's always about the Word, the Word, the Word. Listening to the Word is our responsibility in our relationship with Jesus. Why? Because faith is kindled through hearing the Word. And, and this faith has as its heart and core repentance and a longing for the forgiveness that God freely, generously, and graciously gives us through His Word and His sacraments. This faith is then preserved for us through the storms and stresses of life through the Word. And this faith will escape, conquer, even death itself by clinging to the promises of Jesus that are recorded in the Word. So, Did you hear the sermon Jesus preached this morning? I'll put it up here again. He read these words. I won't reread them for you, but you can follow along. What was Jesus saying? He says, I'm the one about whom these words are speaking. I am the one on whom the Spirit of the Lord has descended. God has anointed me to be your prophet and your priest and your king. And in my work, in those three offices of prophet, priest, and king, he has given to me the work to proclaim good news to the poor. That is, a righteousness from God to the poor folks who have none. He has sent me to proclaim, to announce freedom for the captives, for those prisoners, for those who are held in prison to their sin and guilt and to the whims of the devil and to their fear of death. And he sent me to preach a recovery of sight for the blind, a recovery of, of the sight of faith to those who are blinded in their unbelief. He has sent me to set 
the oppressed free. That is, those who are held captive to devil, death, and hell. He sent me as anointed king to free them. And he sent me to proclaim that in him, or in me, and through me, you have God's favor. Brothers and sisters, certainly you recognize that these great things, these spiritual things that Jesus announced, the things of which he is the fulfillment, are far greater, far longer lasting and enduring, a far greater importance and influence than any other thing in this world for which you could ask. This is why your blessed Jesus was willing to risk, no, to sacrifice his popularity for the truth of his word. And it is why your dear Savior was willing to give up his life. No, not in Nazareth, not on this day. But in Jerusalem, on that Black Friday, that Holy Friday, outside the, the, the city streets of, of Jerusalem, just as God had promised he would. So, your Jesus went to the cross to bleed and to die for you. For, to do what? Just as he had announced in Isaiah, to exchange his righteousness for your sin and guilt. His life for your death. His victory for your defeat, your punishment. And then he rose again from the dead in his body and soul to assure you of your resurrection. So, brothers and sisters, do not be disappointed with Jesus. Do not be angry with him. Instead, listen to him. Listen to what he teaches you about him, who is the word made flesh, about whom all scripture gives witness. As you do that, then, he will lead you to abandon your own feelings and your own opinions opinions about him and his word. In fact, he will compel you to take every thought that runs through your mind, whether that's a feeling or an opinion, and make it captive to the word of Christ. The word of God will so sharpen your thinking and your feelings that you will not, like Jesus, tolerate sin and error. And Jesus has made this promise to you. That as you continue to study and read his word and learn about him, he will strengthen your faith in him. And he promises that he will never abandon you. Those who put their faith and their hope in him will never be disappointed like those people in Nazareth. Because even now, Jesus holds in his hand the crown of life and victory your crown of life and victory. He's promised that to you in his word. Brothers and sisters, believe it. Shall we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this account in St. Luke's Gospel that you came to reveal yourself, make yourself known to us as the fulfillment of all of Scripture. As you have revealed that to us, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would work in our hearts to strengthen our faith in you. Make us hunger and thirst, not just for your forgiveness, not only for the, for the peace and the joy that you give us, but hunger and thirst for your word, so that through it you can sustain our faith through all the storms and stresses of this life. As we continue in your word, Lord Jesus, sharpen our minds and our hearts so that, like you, we do not tolerate sin in our lives and we do not tolerate error of anything, anything that stands opposed to your truth. Lord Jesus, according to your word and your promise, preserve us in faith until that day when we see you not only with the eyes of faith, but with our own eyes at the, la at the end. In your name we ask it. Amen.